Well, hello, 7th graders. Time for our next lesson. This one on a decade of the 1850s, which we're going to call the turbulent 1850s. Remember, last time we talked about the issue of slavery, it was all about compromise. And this gentleman here, uh, Henry Clay, came up with not one but two compromises to help our country grow uh, out west, fulfilling our manifest destiny, while also handling the issue of slavery. The first one, of course, in 1820 was the Missouri Compromise, which allowed Missouri to come in as a slave state. Maine came in as a free state, keeping that balance, and a line drawn across the country to solve future problems. And this is when we bought the Louisiana Territory. Then, of course, as you know, in the 1830s and 40s, we got all kinds of land uh, called our Manifest Destiny. And this time, more complex compromise was needed, and Henry Clay was up to the job. First thing, California free state, Texas slave state. We're going to let this giant area come up with their own solution by voting. That's called popular sovereignty, remember? And then we have no more slave trade in our nation's capital, but on the other hand, a terrible law called the Fugitive Slave Law would be adopted where people all over the country had to help former slaves, escaped slaves, uh, to be returned or breaking the law. That's our trial, of course. So, all these events occurred during the 1850s, and we're going to call it the turbulent 1850s. And, of course, maybe you know turbulence is when a plane gets bumpy. All kinds of things are happening. The 1850s were not smooth. They were very bumpy. And event after event is going to happen, of course, all dealing with slavery, pretty much, that will tear our country apart. And the only thing that can happen is if we can agree to elect a president uh, that we'll, we can all uh, agree with, Maybe we can avoid civil war. Pause here and copy this line in green, and anything for that matter for the remainder of the lesson in green goes on your notes. So the first event on our timeline happens in 1852, and that's of course this lady right here named Harriet Beecher Stowe. And Harriet Beecher Stowe's dad was a preacher. She lived in the north. She wrote a book uh, that shocked the nation. It was one of the first best sellers. A lot of people bought it. It's called Uncle Tom's Cabin. An alternative title was Life Among the Lowly. And that's an appropriate title too because it was really uh, a story about centered around the slave Uncle Tom uh, but also other slaves. And one of the most um, vivid scenes was when a slave, a woman who was a slave, uh, just had a baby and she overheard her master saying that the next day the baby was going to be taken away from her and sold at an auction so she could either stay and let that happen or escape in the cold night and that's what she did and when she did uh, she the Harriet Beecher Stowe talks about how she ran and ran and came to the frozen river and the dogs were at her heels the bloodhounds barking and all this kind of thing uh, and she could either try to cross that river or get caught, and perhaps even chewed up, uh, and lose her child forever in, at the auction. So she jumps out on a chunk of ice, and then she jumps out some more, and you'll have to read the book to see if she makes it, of course. But the story uh, brought the issue of slavery home to a lot of people in the North, especially, who had no idea about slavery. Um, they didn't have a clue what it was like, and she really, through her characters, explained its uh, cruelty and uh, injustice to really the, the whole nation and the world. What's interesting is most people couldn't read at this time. So Uncle Tom's Cabin became a play, and uh, you know most people learned its story through the play. Uh, of course, Southerners were angered by this. They said, this is not a real story, this is fiction. And it was, but it was realistic. Uh, but they were angry because they said Stowe, the author, never owned slaves. She never lived in the South. They felt attacked by the book, of course. Uh, so Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, made a lot of people abolitionists, but made the South angry. Here's your notes. Pause right now so you can copy them and read them to yourself. Our next event happens in 1854, and it has to do with a territory we have not seen organized yet. It's this territory, Kansas. And Kansas, kind of like Utah and New Mexico, uh, are going to be able to vote on whether or not they want to have slavery. 
And again, this is called popular sovereignty. But since it's now 1854 and the country's further divided about slavery and people are angry, something interesting happens. And that's the fact that people from the north come into uh, this particular state. All right, they come into the territory from neighboring states uh, from the north. So they're going to flood in there. People wanted to come in and uh, sway the vote from the free state side. And of course, people from especially Missouri came into Kansas to sway the vote from the slave trade side or the slave supporting side. So what do you think is going to happen when all those people converge on Kansas? It's not going to be a party. Rather, it's going to be violence. And these, you know, almost look like photographs. We don't have photographs yet, but look at this. Here are pro-slavery or anti-slavery people shooting at each other. Here's violence in one of the towns in Kansas. So for the first time ever, people get killed over the issue of slavery. They're arguing over slavery and killing each other. And this comes to be known as bleeding Kansas. Uh, Kansas is bleeding over the issue of slavery. Uh, and it's the very first time ever that slavery became violent. One of the people that was there was this guy. Kind of looks kind of crazy. Maybe not a guy you want to have for dinner. And here he is holding the Bible in one hand and a gun in the other. And this man's name is John Brown. And John Brown uh, became symbolic of a very uh, um, ardent abolitionist who would do anything to end slavery, including kill people. We'll hear more about him later. So here's Bleeding Kansas. Take a few minutes, pause it, and copy your notes here. Make sure you read them to yourself and study them. So look at these objects. What do you think of when you see a car or your iPhone or your backpack? I'm sure you boys all have a Vera backpack. Yeah. And you might think these are all things people own. They're all property. And that's where... This gentleman comes in in our third event that happens in 1856 to 1857, our next event during the turbulent 1850s, uh, pulling our country apart over the issue of slavery. And that's this man. His name is Dred Scott. This is a famous portrait of him. Dred Scott uh, was a slave. He was owned by an army doctor who lived in the slave state of Missouri. But what's interesting is Dred Scott's master took him around with him to free territories. He went to places... Uh, all over the country uh, with his doctor, um, who basically uh, took him to uh, Illinois and Wisconsin, uh, which were free territory. So when Scott came back to Missouri, his master died, and then he said, wait a minute, I've been in free territories, I should be free. So he actually sued for his own freedom, and his case went all the way to the United States Supreme Court, and you might remember this, this came to be known as a landmark court case, all right? And uh, Scott knew he was in trouble when the first thing the Supreme Court Chief Justice said to him was, uh, you're a slave, why are you even in my courtroom? You're not even a citizen. The other thing that Scott probably knew at the time is the Supreme Court Chief Justice, a guy named Tawny, was from a slave-owning family. So that's another strike against him. But ultimately, he said Scott wasn't a person, he's really a piece of property. And since all slaves are property, the Constitution uh, entitles all of us to our property to be taken wherever we want. So this was crazy. The Chief Justice, uh, the Supreme Court, had an opportunity to rule on slavery uh, and kind of make it go, to what, go away. But instead, uh, they basically opened up all new territories to slavery, a huge strike against the abolitionists. Now think about this. The President and Congress weren't passing laws to get rid of slavery. Now here's a chance for the Supreme Court, the third branch of government, uh, to weigh in and, you know, maybe overturn those laws using what's called, remember, judicial review in this landmark court case, and they totally blew it. They made Scott a slave. They sort of doubled down on slavery. And the Dred Scott decision, as it's known, was a court case that solidified slavery in this country and again further split the nation. And here's your notes. And you know what? I'm going to add uh, the phrase on the bottom right here. Landmark court case. I don't think I have that on there. So, I want you to pause these notes at this point, 
and I'd like you to copy this right here, our next event on the turbulent of the turbulent 1850s. All right, and our next event takes place in 1858, and this dude is named uh, Stephen Douglas, and he is a senator from Illinois, and he was called a little giant. He's about five foot tall. And not only was he going to be reelected for Senator of Illinois, but many people expected him to be our next president. Things, of course, didn't go uh, turn out as planned for Mr. Douglas, but let's talk about why he's important here in 1858. He's important in the fact that uh, he went up against a relatively newcomer uh, in politics. Let's take a look at him. So you should know who this guy is, right? There's Abraham Lincoln without uh, his beard. And when Lincoln was a young man, he had no beard. I don't know if you know the story, but a girl named Grace Bedell from Westfield, New York. And Westfield is down off the thruway uh, in Chautauqua County uh, near Lake Erie. And she wrote a letter to Lincoln and said, hey, you would look better with what she called whiskers. We would call it a beard today. Lincoln accepted her advice. And what's cool is um, on his way to becoming president, he actually took sort of a detour uh, uh, type route that nobody expected him to go because people were worried they were they would shoot the president. So his detour actually brought him across the state of New York, and he made a point to stop in Westfield and meet Grace Bedell. And there's a statue in Westfield um, that uh, depicts this. Um, so Lincoln is the opponent of Stephen Douglas. He's running for senator of the uh, for the U.S. Senate. Senator, Senator of Illinois, and he's uh, from a new party called the Republican Party, which was a, an anti-slavery party. You can imagine Lincoln, here is his, I'll show you this next picture. So you can imagine Lincoln, and this is probably a generous picture, standing up on the stage. You know, people would hand build the stage, they'd literally jump up on a, a tree stump, and they would have a series of debates. And you can imagine Lincoln at about six foot four, towering over the little giant Douglas, who a lot of people respected and admired. He was a good public speaker. Lincoln had kind of a high squeaky voice, but Lincoln was incredibly smart and could think on his feet and was funny. And Lincoln really made a mark in these debates. It'd be like me getting on stage with Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. And even though, you know, nobody, first of all, I might lose because I'm not very well known. Uh, but if I did a decent job, people will say, hey, that guy, you know, really stayed with those two candidates. He's pretty good. Who is that guy? Oh, his name's Jafarjan. And all of a sudden, just by being on that stage, I would become a nationally known figure. And that's what happened to Abraham Lincoln. He lost the election to Illinois Senate, but he became a nationally known figure. And in only two years, Lincoln, who failed and failed and failed, then would be elected our president, would be the president who wins the Civil War. The Lincoln-Douglas debates, another event uh, highlighting slavery uh, during the turbulent 1850s. So here's your note. Here's your notes on the uh, Lincoln-Douglas debates. Pause for a moment and copy these guys. Now I told you John Brown would be back, and he was. John Brown, uh, who was at Bleeding Kansas and basically killed people because they were believers and, and holders of slaves. He was sort of a religious zealot against slavery. He had good intentions, but you could say he went about in the wrong way. And here's John Brown, right? Remember with that big beard? And he actually took his uh, sons with him. And they took over a place in Virginia called Harper's Ferry. And this place here is called an arsenal. It's a place where weapons are kept. Now, why would he do that? He wanted weapons because he was going to put a call out to the countryside and have slaves show up and give them weapons and say, let's start a revolution against slave owners. Um, no slaves came, but the U.S. Army did. And they surrounded the place. They captured John Brown. Some people were killed. And ultimately, John Brown was put on trial and sentenced to death for this uh, crime. Treason, right? So we're going to hang John Brown. Now, look at this one. On the bottom left, we see anti-slavery mass meeting. A lot of people uh, were against slavery, and they felt that if John Brown's going to be executed, that's not fair. Um, they stood up for him, and um, they were upset by this, right? And they even had a song, um, kind of like that Glory, Glory, Hallelujah song, 
Uh, John Brown's body lies a moldrin in the grave. And they kept singing this and then say, his truth is marching on. And they felt what he did was honorable. Um, these are the abolitionists and many people in the North viewed John Brown's actions of starting a war against slavery and killing people over slavery and trying to get slaves to revolt against their white masters and families uh, as honorable. People in the South thought this was completely insane. And they were very angry at the North and very angry that anyone could support John Brown, who basically tried to kill them. Um, so this showed a lot of people that, hey, we don't really have much in common with the rest of our country. And a lot of Southerners basically started saying, hey, what if we leave the country? What if we become our own country? In other words, what if we secede or leave the Union? And ultimately, that is going to be what they're going to do, not just yet. But the trial and the attack, uh, the, the raid on Harper's Ferry, Virginia, uh, caused a lot of people to get angry about what uh, pro- and anti-slavery people were doing. So here's your notes on John Brown. Let's stop for a moment and uh, get these. But wait, here's the word martyr. Remember that? He became a martyr for his cause. People thought he was a martyr. Um, people in the South said, holy cow, how can you call him a martyr? This guy just tried to get our slaves to kill us. Pause for a moment. Copy these notes. So the turbulent 1850s end with one last shot at solving the problem. There's no more Henry Clay to create uh, a compromise. We have the election of 1860. If we can choose a president that all sides can agree with, maybe we can get out of this thing and not fight each other. But look at this map of how the election goes down. Sweet mama. We've got colors in the north. We've got another color in the south. And we've got the middle states completely disagreeing. Right Now check this out. A guy named Breckinridge wins the southern states. Lincoln wins all the northern and western states. And there's Douglas in purple. Um, that's Stephen Douglas, who was supposed to be the next president, right? And he was wishy-washy about slavery. Lincoln said no slavery. Breckinridge said let's have slavery. Douglas kind of said, eh, we'll have slavery if people vote on it, but maybe we should have it out west, maybe we shouldn't. So nobody really liked his views at all because he didn't really take a stand. So it crushed him in the election. But look at this. The results show you that basically, uh, even though Breckinridge, the uh, candidate, won every state in the south, the South was so outnumbered and so uh, uh, controlled by the North that the Northern states uh, overpowered them and their guy became president, even though nobody in the South wanted him. So a lot of people in the South said, hold the phone. We didn't even vote for this guy, Lincoln, who's anti-slavery. He's going to ruin our lifestyle, take away our slaves and control us. And uh, the federal government's going to tell all the states what they have to do. And we don't believe in that. We believe in a concept called states' rights where states can do what they want and have power over the federal government. So we don't have anything in common with the United States anymore. It's time for us to withdraw, to secede from the Union, and create our own country. And that's exactly what these southern states did. Uh, they seceded from the United States. And there's the first one, South Carolina. Okay, so check this out. Let's take a moment. And we'll get into the start of the actual Civil War next time. But I want you, you did a good job. I know this is a lot. So make sure you keep studying these notes, looking things over. And I want you to pause now and make sure you have these notes. There are one, just one, more, one or two more slides. Stay with me. And there it is. Starting in uh, December 20th, 1860, South Carolina becomes the first state to secede for the Union from the Union. This will set the stage for the Civil War. And when we talk next time, uh, Abraham Lincoln had a choice. Either A, let South Carolina and the other states just go and become their own country, or B, fight to keep the country together and also fight to end slavery. Good job. I hope you learned what you needed to. And keep watching. Keep studying your notes. Uh, let's move on to some other things now. Have a great day.